This morning we will be discussing the Governor of the Central Bank. Attorney Jean-Louis Kelly will be joining me here in about uh, 40 minutes from now. And we will talk about um, what the law says regarding the Governor of the Central Bank, who can discipline and or curtail the actions of the Governor General or dismiss him or who he's answerable to. All those questions will be answered when we get to that conversation. This is Brunch on 107.7. My name is Ronnie Bishop. It is good to have you this Sunday morning. I trust that you're having a good morning and thank you so much for choosing to spend it with me. The question of industrial relations. Well, it has been going on for a long time and will continue forever because companies have their view as to their priority. The employees say that while we may share that priority, you must look at ours equally. The recent layoffs of 600 employees of AcelloMetal follows a pattern according to the union of a smaller um, uh, layoffs and contractual abuse. A similar, I'm sorry, that should be similar layoffs and contractual abuse by the company under the cloak of recession. The union is saying that this is just an example of them doing what they have done around the world. It is truly a worldwide problem for companies going beyond borders for profits. For instance, if one country does not um, pro- provide conducive atmosphere for, atmosphere for their profit margin, well, they simply close up shop and go to another country. This, of course, is against a backdrop of nations aggressively begging multinationals to come and invest in their country. So you've got two interests going on at the same time. One is the profit margin for the company. Two is the, the, the pleading um, incentivizing the environment to get multinationals to come in. And then there is the question of the workers, where they stand in the middle of this when they find a situation while they are willing to work that does not seem to keep their interests at the top of the burner. This is the case we are looking at with Asala Mittal, and we'd like to welcome the Secretary General of the Communication Workers, Joseph Remy, to be with us. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, yourself, and yourself, Remy. I'm good. It's a pleasure to be on your program. And the pleasure is ours indeed. We are looking for elucidation that I'm sure you will provide. Tell us, first of all, as we lay the foundation here, what is the overall the industrial relations um, uh, 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 climate you have enjoyed with this company, Asala Mittal, um, have the pre- previous to this last um, this last bout where you have uh, 600 employees being sent home. Okay, let me just clear up one. Um, let me correct something here. The, the representative um, trade union for that company is the Steel Workers Union of Steel Trinidad Tobago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the, we are all part of the joint trade union movement, and Thank it's you. against that background that the press conference was held at our union hall, and we expressed our strong solidarity with with Steel Workers Union, but they are the bargaining agent for those workers at Akarlo Mittal, Trinidad and Tobago Limited, and it's not the communication workers. Union. Right. So I need to just put that in. Right. You are the secretary there, but you also are of the joint trade union movement. That's, that's it's in definitely. that capacity that you speak this morning. Definitely, definitely. Pretty clear. Go ahead. Speak to me as best you know as to the relationship between uh, Asala Mittal generally uh, with workers. And I, I want to, I'll get down to the specifics of this case, but I want to set some context as to what obtained before we got to this point, as your best understanding. Okay, based on our relationship with the Steelworkers un- Trade Union of Trinidad and Tobago, all the indication points to the fact that it has been a very rocky relationship all along since Mittal entered into the frame. And, and they would have been able to get the steel mill mm-hmm. when, again, we were in problems with steel prices internationally. And the government, in their quest to pump some activity, economic activity, in the Point Lisa's industrial estate, they went into this arrangement with Mittal when it was a spot before, and, and they went into this arrangement with Mittal, and they bought in to the whole arrangement, but they would have been given some concession on the basis of what would have been then considered foreign direct investment. Mm-hmm. And, and since then, from all indication in terms of our discussions with the Steelworkers Union, the relationship have been very rocky. They have had a very torrid time dealing with this multinational and this particular situation now is a culmination of a rocky relationship over the years. I want to get into um, metal in a, in a m- moment, but I mean, many argue, look, China uh, got steel on the market, prices are depressed, things are very tough for the steel industry, generally as a result of cheaper steel coming on the market. Folks are saying it's just a, a tough economy, and in a tough economy, layoffs will occur. Why is this different, and what is the premise for asking for government's intervention in this particular instance? Uh, and and the, the situation is different. The, the difference is that the approach, and I think is the approach by Metal in terms of how they would have gone about doing what they did. Mm-hmm. And, and 
from a trade union perspective, we have to look and see what is happening there. Because once these things are embedded in the industrial relations, climate, and the environment, then it affects all the other industries where there are foreign multinationals operating. And it's a telling signal that we would have to speak out against. The approach, they are breaching the laws of the country. They are breaching good industrial relations practices in the way how they are doing it. And, and what we are saying to them is that when you are operating in Trinidad and Tobago, you need to operate consistent with the laws of the land. And all we are saying is that there are laws that governs how these things are to be done, and you should follow those laws when you are dealing with workers. There's an Industrial Relations Act, and we are saying follow the provisions of the Industrial Relations Act and ensure that we don't flout the laws in order to satisfy some particular situation. And we are convinced in this instance, because the information coming to us in the overall trade union movement is while Mittal is making these claims about low prices in the industry, which we don't deny, we are saying that the burden should be shared equitably. Mm. But I'm not seeing that. We are not seeing that because we would like Mittal to reveal to us what they are doing about executive pay for these experts. And that is the biggest problem that the workers are having, that they are asking the workers to ban their belly at the bottom end. But we have about 20-something foreign experts in, in metal earning as much on a monthly basis as the salary for about 400 workers. Mm. And that is a dangerous trend, and that is something that nobody wants to address. Executive pay in these foreign mul- in, in these uh, multinationals, when they are paid in the currency where the company is headquartered, you know, it's headquartered so that they are being paid in U.S. dollars. Mm-hmm. And, and, and when you make that comparison to the workers' salary in Trinidad and Tobago, it's chalk and cheese. And, and those are the circumstances under which we're saying that the approach to this situation is flawed. There should have been much more dialogue and discussions. And don't just show the recession and the bottom line, because if it's the bottom line, then we are convinced that the wage freeze and cut should have taken place at the executive level, which we believe is where the hemorrhaging is taking place. Not to confuse the issue, the disparity you speak of is one thing. The other thing is flouting the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. But I should ask you this. Have you seen a pattern of this um, of this company? Um, by the way, Joseph Remy is the voice we're speaking of. He's not uh, a, the, a member of the Steelworkers Union, but they are a part of the Joint Trade Union Movement. It is in that capacity we're speaking to him. So, so so the question is, is there a pattern of disrespecting um, laws in different countries and the way they deal with workers by this company? Or is this something, to the best of your knowledge, that is unique to Trinidad and Tobago? Well, it's not unique to Trinidad and Tobago, but it's, un- it, it's not unique. It's really indigenous of metal. Mm. That's the way how they operate. And that's the way how this guy would have amassed his wealth. He goes around the world in, in countries where he believes it's very easy to exploit wage labor. So we have in India, we have in Finland, we have in South Africa, there are instances where we are seeing massive job cuts in Mm -hmm. metal itself. You know what I mean? And not in much of the other um, energy-based industries. And and it's its practice. And what has happened, and let me put some context to this, Renny, because I think what we need to do is establish how how this thing evolved and the, the timelines. In August this year, the Privy Council gave a judgment, gave a ruling, on an appeal that was filed by Mittal against the Steelworkers Union with respect to the use of contract work in, in the steel industry. Mm-hmm. It's a landmark judgment for the trade union movement because it spoke to the issue of Mittal violating the provisions of the Industrial Relations Act, Section 2, 4B, which talks to the relationship that should exist when you have a third-party employment um, situation. So, in, for instance, Mittal would hire an agency to provide contract work to the company. Mm-hmm. But they will bring in these workers and have them working, doing the same thing, and doing the same jobs like bargaining unit employees, but pay them substantially less than the bargaining unit employees. Mm-hmm. And the Steel Workers Union took that matter up, and they won the matter at the industrial court, and that judgment was given in July 2009. And this is for a case, uh, this is for a dismissal that occurred over 20 years ago. That's right, definitely. Mm-hmm. In 1998, the, the issue evolved. Right? And in 2009, the industrial court ruled and ruled in favor of the union. Mittal appealed, and the appeal court of Trinidad and Tobago ruled in favor of the union in 2011. And they went to the Privy Council, and the Privy Council ruled again in 2015, August of this year, 2015, mm-hmm. saying that Mittal was flouting the laws and that they have been ordered to ensure 
that when you bring in these third party employees into the organization consistent with the provisions of section 24b of the industrial relations act then you should afford them similar terms and conditions as the bargaining unit employees for the duration of the time that they work in the establishment. And that is the sad thing that comes out of a case like this because, That's you right. know, it is true that uh, um, justice uh, delayed is justice denied because Definitely 20 years ago you have a lot a lot of people who either died or, or did not get a chance to enjoy what was rightfully judgment. theirs. Definitely. All right. And, and what we have seen since then is since August you have seen a, a ramping up of the activity and the action by Mittal in terms of downsizing and, and we are convinced that what they are doing what they have realized now is that they can continue to exploit contract labor because they must now abide by the provisions of the um, collective agreement and as such what they want to do is to gradually pull out of Trinidad and Tobago that is our analysis mm -hmm, you I know, because they want to go somewhere else where the they could exploit wage labor again, and that has been the pattern of metal all over, and that is how he has amassed his wealth. This situation will go before the industrial court. We will hear both sides, and uh, we are hearing the side of the workers right now. Um, there is a statement that was made by Jetum, um, which said that uh, this time around, metal has gone to Parang at the wrong house. I can I can uh, get the inference of that. Would you like to clarify it? Well, you know, what, what we said, and I said it, I was very clear in my statement, is that what they have done in December, the middle of December 2015, mm -hmm. when workers unexpectedly would have been given this notice while they were in the preparation for Christmas season, they have disrupted the family lives of these workers, you know. They have disrupted the, li disrupted the lives of families, children, wives, husbands, you know. And, and, and what they have done is make them very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, this is Trinidad and Tobago. This is Christmas time. We normally parang. Sometimes you parang the right <laughs> house. Sometimes we parang the wrong house. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying to metal uh, workers that while they are very uncomfortable because of what the executives would have done, we must ensure that there is equity in the treatment and make these executives feel the same um, discomfort that we are feeling now as workers. Because when you touch one, you touch all, eh? Because mm -hmm. we have to protect this whole thing. So then, in, tr in true Trinidad style, we should power on some of those executives out. Joseph Remy is the voice you're hearing. When I heard it, I harkened back to monkey, you know what, tree to climb. That's right. Anyway, <laughs> okay, I got that. <laughs> Let's deal with the workers here. Does the Retrenchment and Severance Benefit Act cover uh, workers laid off by uh, a seller metal in this case? Well, uh, that is what we're saying. We don't know what would, would have been the, the, the steps and what would have been the, the context in which they did this. They, they never they started to talk to the union and from the reports we have been getting at the in the joint trade union movement is that they were discussing the issue of forcing workers to go on vacation leave and and while those discussions were taking place mm. in the midst of bilateral discussion with the union they took this action now they have not they have not gone through the provisions of any law in Trinidad Tobago neither the retrenchment and severance benefit act nor the industrial relations act and, and that is what we're saying. They are flouting the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. And in this case, they should return to the table in discussions with the union, maintain the status quo with, the, with these workers, and arrive at a resolution to this matter instead of taking this high-handed approach. And let the laws of the land take effect if there is evidence from Metal that they are in such a dire financial situation mm -hmm. and place that of, across to somebody between, with the workers and the union and let them find a mutually acceptable solution to moving forward. It can't be high-handed in a one in a in a kind of imposition kind of matter. And there that, are that some concern we have in. There are some of our listeners who will probably think that this is just an industrial uh, relations situation between workers and a seller metal. But uh, make clear to our listeners how the uh, the, the overall impact to the economy um, that, that that is possible with this action taken by a seller metal. Definitely, and and you see what we are doing is we are removing. Um, hundreds of workers from engaging in economic activity in Trinidad and Tobago. The spiraling effect of that is that they are the ones who normally would engage in, in, in spending at the small business sector, which also employs two and three and four workers. You know what I mean? And as such, what you are seeing, what is going to happen is by the fact that they are now out of that economic loop, we have, it is going to impact on small businesses, it is going to impact on employment levels in those small business sector, and it is going to impact on the overall economy of Trinidad and Tobago. Because, let us be clear, you know, the, first, the people who carry economic activity in Trinidad and Tobago are the working class. They are the ones who engage in economic activity because we have been caught 
in a spiral of spending and a spiral of debt because we have mortgages to pay, we have bills to satisfy, we have to put food on our table, we have to continue to travel, and by the time you get paid, that whole cycle comes around again. And we are the ones who continue to carry the economic activity in Trinidad and Tobago while the expats go out to Miami and go out to Panama and the, these other places and shop. And they use up foreign exchange instead of bringing in foreign exchange in the, into the country, instead of stopping the outflow of foreign exchange. And as such, it is going to impact on the econ economy of Trinidad and Tobago. Once we have workers with less purchasing power, then e the economy of Trinidad and Tobago is going to be stagnated. And we are seeing the signs right now. It is very clear to us by the fact that these things are happening and it is impacting negatively on the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. Inequity is something we must always uh, look at. However, not to be confused with the multinationals' right to hire how many expats they want at whatever price they agree to. You were saying if you have um, budget cutting, austerity measures, for instance, because of a glut of the market, uh, on the market in this case of steel coming out of China, you just want to see that the burden is shared by Equitably. all, including the, 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 the expats. Definitely, because, you know, we are we are very concerned, you know, and, and it is alarming when we see the level of executive pay at Mittal, you know, when one person could be receiving about 98,000 U.S. a month, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a month, you know, and we are sending home uh, workers who are receiving under 10,000 TT a month, you know what I mean? And, and that is a disparity that I, I don't know if you could call that a gap anymore. It's so wide, I do. You have to find a different word to call it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and those are the, the, the circumstances under which we are raising our concerns, because when you take that into the Trinidad and Tobago dollar context, you are talking about 500,000 TT per month mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one expat is receiving. And, and if how much local workers that could be? But how is, how, is, how is expertise factored into that? I must ask you, in, just in fairness, I mean, if a company decides it's going to pay you, uh, Joseph Remy, I'm going to pay you $500,000, I'm paying the next guy um, that I may happen uh, that I employ from the, from, from the home country, and I'm going to pay him $100,000, let's arguably say that, a big gap of $400,000, but I'm hiring you because you are a geologist, you have the expertise in this, and the, and, and the company must have the experts. I mean, is, is that something that we have to take into consideration? consideration when, when, when we see these gaps, is it not? Well, definitely, but you know, one of the things, Rennie, that um, we are concerned about, this steel mill, this plant was developed many, many years ago, was Iscot. Mm -hmm. We were one of the first in the, we were the first in the Caribbean region to develop that capacity to do that production. In Scott, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we went into Iscot, and we are seeing, every time we bring these multinationals in, there has to be some arrangement for the transfer of knowledge to locals, so that at the end of the day, we can't stop the, the, the multinationals from bringing in their expertise. I am so happy that you say that, Joseph, because at the end of the day, that is what we are looking at. Governments must be told that when you're bringing people in, here is the provision. You were given your tax concessions, etc., and, and, and your environment right. to set up shop, but here are the things you must do over a period of this. There must be what we can call performance um, benchmarks that you show me you are training people, and it, that is something I would expect, and I, I hope to see more of the trade unions and, 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 and folks in Trinidad and Tobago uh, insisting upon. And, and this is what we are seeing in this circumstance. You know, when you have 20, mm. 22 executives at Mittal and all are expats, that has to be a, a cause for concern, major mm -hmm. concern. Where are the local expertise in the steel industry? We, this steel industry is not new to Trinidad and Tobago. And we are saying, how do we ensure that as the thing evolves and as the, the, the technology evolves, our locals are given the opportunity to develop the competencies and the ability to manage these organizations, and we transfer the knowledge into us. We can we have to understand we are in a global village, but we are in an indigenous country. We are a sovereign nation, and as such, we have to continue to ensure that while we train and develop, we are turning out people from the universities on a regular basis. What opportunities are we providing for them when we bring in these foreign exp um, um, expats? And, and place them at the executive level. The opportunity for growth and development of our local talent is being stymied and stunted. And we are saying governments must ensure that when they get into these arrangements, they make provisions for those kind of things to take place. We're looking at eight minutes after 11 o'clock. You're inside the program, Brunch 107.7. My name is Bishop. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. We're discussing the situation of 600 employees. Um, but the 600 employees who were recently uh, laid off by Asala Metal is not the only ones they have uh, retrenched or laid off for the year, is no, it? No, 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 it's not. It's not. And, and if, you, if we, in discussion with the Steelworkers Union, we have discovered that they 
have affected the, li the lives of over 1,500 employees mm. for the year so far. Mm. And this includes those that the downstream industries you're speaking well, of, or directly? It is not including those on the downstream. So when we add those in the downstream, it is going to be more. Because we have Tube mm. City has already said that they are going to lay off 40 persons. Mm -hmm. We have discussions that are taking place now, based on the reports coming to us, between the union and Centrin, which is a heavy local downstream industry. So it is going to have a ripple effect. On, on, on the industry, it is going to have a ripple effect in the economy. And it, we're talking about three, I, I am going to anticipate close to 3,000 jobs are going to be impacted upon by this action of Mittal. And, and we have to stop this thing immediately. And I am saying there has to be an inter intervention at a particular level. Bring parties across the table hmm. and engage in objective dispassionate discussions about the way forward because this thing is going to have not just economic fallout it is going to have social fallout and that is the fear we are having you know what is going to happen in the society when we have hundreds of thousands of people on the bread line can't feed their family who is going to make that provision for them you know and one of the things we are also saying Rennie this time that we engage in discussions around an unemployment relief fund mm -hmm. these foreign multinationals come into this country and we are saying they should be contributing towards a fund. So in circumstances like these, when we have these downturn and when we have these economic cycles that places employees at risk, there is a buffer for the employees during these periods. But this buffer must not only be, uh, we should not even or only be subscribed to by multinationals <laughs> as a matter of fact, all employers that's right. you're and, and saying that's should right. contribute I agree to with this, you. right? And, and I, we have been clamoring for that for quite a while. And we believe now is the opportune time to introduce something like that so that we could give some level of comfort and avoid the shock that is going to take place in our society when these things happen. You know, there is no provision anywhere. And, you know, Mittal is saying that they pay these workers for the vacation leave. But it's not, it's not a gift. They, that is an entitlement. That Expl they had. They explain that detail because, yes, I did read that they were paid up until, I think, is the end of January. You're saying this is vacation money that was paid. That and is what they are saying, and that is what we have been told, you know. So, so there is a... There are misinformation coming out in the public domain, and I think that... No, but is that, is that, Mr. Remy, is that in f a fact that all they paid was the vacation leave? I'm trying to get that clear so our listeners that understand. Is, that is what we have been told. The, no, no favors were done here. This is owed you, in other words. That's, that's right, what that's they paid. Right, that's right. It was never a favor. The voice you're hearing, um, while not a member of the Steel Workers Union, which represents the workers at Mattel, is Joseph Remy. He's the Secretary General of the Communication Workers Union, but indirectly uh, related to all the unions involved in the joint trade union movement, and we're talking about the situation at Asela Mittel uh, with workers who were sent home and the ripple effect that will have as a consequence as the company claims of cheap steel being on the market, the glut as it were, and the current economy both working against the interest of continuing the profit level they have done before. That is the claim of Asela Mittel. In addition to what we have articulated, how would the joint trade union movement advise the government of uh, 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 what kind of conditions additionally would you ask them to do? One, to safeguard against this abuse coming in from corporate uh, superpowers, because you must concur that we need these multinationals in, in, in the country. And, and, and our advice is that they, 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 there has to be an urgent intervention. There has to be a discussion, pulling the chamber, pulling the ECA, pulling these multinationals mm -hmm. with the trade union movement, and, and let us indicate to them the, the dire circumstances that is going to occur as a result of the action that they propose to take and the fact that they are going to place the government in a very precarious position by the action because the people that the lives who they are affecting are the people who are voting power and the multinationals don't. I, you know, many, many of our listeners, yours truly included, will concur with you with what you just said. The question is, what else can you do? What else would the trade union movement propose that government do to protect against uh, abu uh, abuses like this. Okay, and we are saying, Rennie, there, there has to be some legal provision. We, has, we, we have to find a way to put into the laws of Trinidad and Tobago some kind of protection mechanism for workers. The Industrial Relations Act has failed us miserably over the years, and we have been clamoring for amendments to that. Mm. What was proposed by the last government was, not, was mm. not adequate to deal with the shortcomings of the Act and the other related labor legislation that now places work workers in a precarious situation. So we are saying immediate review of the labor laws is going to make some kind of inroads into providing some level of um, support at this time. Our concern is that we are in a 
immediate situation. The immediate situation is that the economy is on a, a slide down. It's on the skids, yes. We're on a very slippery slope and we are sliding very fast, like we're in free fall. So let us sit together. We are aware of the challenges. We may have to sit down and come up with innovative ways of doing collective bargaining. We, have, we are not uh, averse to that. But we are seeing on the flip side of that, there has to be some control of the prices in Trinidad and Tobago. So that if workers are to say, look, I can't get a 10% or 8% or a 5% increase at this time, mm-hmm. but let me ensure that my dollar that I could use in 2015 to purchase X could continue to purchase X in 2016 because I'm not going to see a situation where I am going to make the sacrifice by not make, taking an increase. But the prices are going to increase. The businessman is going to continue mm. to get his return on his investment. And I'm getting none because my dollar has now been eroded by about 15 to 20% again when you have no control over the prices. And, and we have to find ourselves in that situation where bold action mm. is taken to put some kind of price control in Trinidad and Tobago to ensure that our purchasing power of our dollar remains with some kind of value going forward. I'm looking at just about three minutes I have on, on this segment here, uh, Joseph, and thank you so much for being here. But I do want to ask you about something. It was asked, it was suggested that one of the downstream uh, companies would be laying off 40 people. And I, I think there is something that says that the minister will intervene or cannot intervene uh, unless you have 40-plus people who are laid off. Is that uh, Clarify that air for me, please. Yeah, there's a provision in the, in the Retrenchment and Severance Benefit Act that, that, that makes um, calls for an intervention by the minister when it crosses a certain number mm. and, and the act kicks in when there are certain actions. From our uh, recollection, you know, once more than five or six workers are threatened with retrenchment, mm-hmm. then the provisions of the re- are retrenchment and severance benefit are kicks in. And as such, we believe once the law takes effect, then by extension, if the minister cannot intervene directly through the role of the Minister of Labor as a third party legally, then as a government, you know what I mean, seeking the overall interest of the state, mm-hmm. they could pull these parties together without any legal imposition, but with moral mm-hmm. suasion in terms of having a discussion because it is going to impact on the economy. And we are saying there are times we conveniently go to the law, and there are times we shun away from the same law that we want to go mm-hmm. to conveniently. So we breach in the provisions of the Act, but we want to go to the provisions of the same Act to say that the minister can't intervene. And, and that, to us, is the contradiction that takes place in the society. Well, I'm looking, I'm looking at some moral uh, persuasion being attempted here. The Labour Minister, uh, Jennifer Batiste Prime, is calling on companies to only send home workers as a last option. Um, <laughs> at, least, at least some effort is made there. Let well, me think. I'm I, sorry. I give her credit for that, but I think this calls for an intervention mm. at a higher level, and I think the person that they ought to listen to is the Prime Minister of the Republic of Shindan and Tobago. And I believe that he has an obligation at this time to intervene, not because of any other thing, but because of the fact that it is going to impact negatively on the economy of Trinidad. And, and I'm happy to hear that because I heard some talkers, because Labour supported you, you're supposed to do this. It has nothing to do with that. That's exactly that's my point. It must be just on the basis of... Yes. We, we, the Communication Workers Union mm. didn't sign the MOA, so there is no obligation for Good the, enough. Good the enough. government for anything in exchange. Is on the basis of the fact that this mm. is a country that is in a certain situation, yes. and it calls for intervention at the highest order to bring some level of stability to the society. That is either bad reporting or somebody didn't think out of what they said. Definitely, and I think people normally take things out of context and put it as headlines. Joseph Remy, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I truly appreciate your clarity and appreciate your representation, as I'm sure uh, your, your your members uh, of the JTM, JTUM, are very thankful that you're there to represent them, and our, our listeners are very happy for the clarity. It was a pleasure, bring. Remy, and... Have a wonderful program. We'll be in touch. Thank you very much, sir. You take care. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. 18 minutes after 11 o'clock, you inside brunch at 107.7. My next guest is in place. No, it is not the governor of the Central Bank. Uh, It is someone who will bring some clarity as to who is the power of the ability to appoint, the ability to censor, the ability to remove, and the sort of cooperation we expect between a governor of a central bank and the government in power. All that will be discussed when my next Next guest, he is Attorney Jean-Louis Kelly when we return and continue Inside Brunch.